from DataStax. This is the Distributed Data Show podcast. From DataStax, this is the Distributed Data Show podcast. From DataStax, this is the Distributed Data Show podcast. Distributed Data Show podcast. There we go. All right, let's try this again, everybody. We, <laughs> we had the wrong screen that was on focus. As I said earlier, which you probably saw me pantomime, uh, this is another episode of the Graph and Code Show with Denise and David. I am Dave Joan Chilardi, and I'm joined with, as usual, with our wonderful Denise Gosnell. I'm happy to know that everybody can hear me now, right? I'm seeing. Yep. Yes, you can hear me now. Wonderful. Anyway, hello. There so go. To- All right. Let's go. And- <laughs> there we go. We have the wrong screen. That was on focus. As I said earlier, which you probably saw me pantomime, uh, this is another episode. I'm getting some major uh, feedback. With- Denise, David, I- do you have your Party. volume on the stream? As usual, with our wonderful Denise Gosnell. I'm happy to know that everybody can hear me now, right? Yes. I'm seeing- yep. Yes, you can hear me now. Wonderful. Anyway. Hello. There so we go. go. All right. Let's Yay. try. And there we go. We have the there wrong we go. screen. That was on focus. As I said earlier, which you probably saw me pantomime, uh, this is another episode. I'm getting some major uh, feedback. With Denise, David, uh, I, do you have your party. volume on the with stream? As usual, with our wonderful Denise Gosnell. Yeah, that's that's coming from Denise's end. <laughs> Sorry, Denise. I, I muted you for a second and it stops. I don't know what happened there. All right, so I yep. think we're done with the audio loop for now. Okay, there you go. Woo! Yeah, okay, we got it. We I, uh, got it. I think all that good. was me, guys. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think I think now with these shows, since they are live and it's fun this way, I think we should just always start with a blooper right off in the beginning know, right? every single time because we seem to be very good at it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, sorry, everyone, that was uh, that was my bad. I was uh, trying to hop too quickly from another session right to this one and forgot that my entire laptop's audio was playing the live YouTube uh, session over here because I'm watching your comments live right over here. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's always fun to get things started with a little bit of a hiccup, but hey, we're, uh, we're just going yeah, to roll with it. So sorry about good. that, everybody. Yeah, no worries, no worries. So let's see. So just a recap, right? So last our last sessions, we ended finishing out chapter three. And Denise, you gave me some homework to do, right? Which So, you know, this whole show has been based off of kind of Denise bringing me through this graph book experience with completely fresh eyes, right? Yep. Where I'm I'm coming at this, yes, I've had graph experience, but I'm coming at the graph book and the contents, you know, fairly new. But last week, Denise gave me a little homework and she said, you need to go off and take a look at chapter four and kind of get your head wrapped around a little bit, right? And so I went and Absolutely. did that. Yep. And funny enough in doing that, um, I'm gonna still summarize things up here in a moment, but in doing that, I ran across a couple things that I'm sure hoping that you can help answer for me. Oh, okay, um, great. But anyway, I did my homework. I did oh, what you great. said. Thanks, right? David. <laughs> so yes, I, I did did actually listen. Um, but yeah, so today we are going to start with chapter four uh, mm-hmm. at this point. So if you've been following along, um, we are now going to start at the very top of chapter four. Denise is going to bring us through. Denise, you have anything else you want to say to uh, get us going here? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great that's great. <laughs> First, just another uh, another apology for my audio bloop there. But, uh, but it yeah, livens so, things up. Come on. It does. It does. <laughs> if people stuck with us after that, that's excellent. Yeah, right. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the story that we've been on uh, has been about understanding a, a customer in a financial system, like customers own credit cards and accounts and they pay loans. And so we're adding on neighborhoods of data to that example so that we can answer three important questions in chapter four. So we're, we're here to answer these three business questions. 
what are the most recent 20 transactions involving uh, Michael's account, someone we've been following throughout the story? The second question is gonna be in December, which vendors did Michael shop and at what frequency? And then uh, the third one is gonna say, find and update the transactions that two of our characters, Jamie and Aaliyah, most value. Hmm. The transactions that represent payments from their checking account to their mortgage loan. Um, so we have, uh, uh, you know, those are gonna be the three questions that we're talking about as we walk through multiple neighborhoods of graph data. And, uh, and I think one of the first things we, we started with was we have this basic model with a customer and then three vertices attached to it, but we need to add on the idea of transactions. And so I think we wanted to first start off with that, unless, uh, depending on where you went with your homework, David, you had some questions right off the bat. No, I think, I think let's just go ahead and start there, right? Okay. Let's build it up. And then as we go through the chapter four materials, we're going to naturally run into my questions. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. All so right. So we you want me to share my screen? That'd be great. That'd be great. Let's do that. Do, 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 do. And I, I like Ooh. this example the most because uh, the the data modeling idea we're about to walk through re represents this massive debate that almost every team I've ever worked with, including my own, uh, whenever you get into the idea of modeling data like a graph, it, it just becomes this argument of like, what's supposed to be a vertex? What's supposed to be an edge? Mm -hmm. And honestly, those conversations get heated and they take a long time. So uh, we wanted to start off with a little bit of kind of walking you through how um, dozens of teams around the world have converged on some common data modeling ideas. Uh, and so one of the first things we had uh, was a, uh, a Lucid chart link, actually. Can we start there? OK, yeah, let's do it. I just happen to magically have Lucid chart ready to go. Oh. I don't know how that happened. That's awesome. That's awesome. Is there? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you happen to have that share link available? I can grab it over here if that would be that would be. Oh, great. you mean for Lucid Chart itself? Yeah. Could you, if you've, is that the one you gave me? That is, and I, uh, I will drop that over into the chat here. Drop it. Yeah, let's go yeah. ahead and drop that. I'll put it in the YouTube chat here. Oh, cool. Uh, okay. Uh, here in a second, but uh, but what this is is what we have is we have all of our books images that we made uh, on Lucid Chart. Uh, we've open sourced them so that anyone can view them. And so that's what David has pulled up here. And we are looking at the chapter four images uh, because the idea is that we need to model transactions. So okay. we have at the end of chapter three, we have a customer and we have accounts and we have credit cards. And so we need to add a layer onto that and model transactions uh, in our, uh, you know, in our, in our graph database. And so typically, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a series, uh, a series of these images. And this series of images represents, one, the common thought process that we have seen, uh, you know, people uh, develop over time when they're trying to model something else. And we're going to come up with some recommendations for graph data modeling along the way. So um, I have the link now for these. And I'm okay. popping that over into the YouTube channel comments. Uh, so that everyone can get access to all of our book images. Uh, so that just came over into YouTube. Okay, great. Cool. So yeah. the, the first one, the first one that you're looking at here, David. Okay, so when we have this idea of adding on transactions into accounts, most people start with where you are. And I don't know how your screen is set up, but there's like a bar on the bottom and it's hard to see. Yeah, okay, cool. So most <laughs> people start here, right? Like you yeah. have an account and these accounts transact with other accounts, right? Okay. I don't know if you thought saw that in your head, but commonly when we're talking with people, that's where they see it. But the, the problem here is that when you have an account vertex and you're thinking about the edge, like acting on the account, you're thinking about transactions in that sense, like a, like a verb. And I know we're going to get pretty yes, pedantic yes. here. Yeah. But think about the questions that we're trying to ask. We're trying to ask like, what are the most recent twenty? Like, what are the most recent 20 transactions involving Michael's account? Or okay. using these transactions, tell me something else. And the way that we're talking about the questions that we want to answer, we're thinking about transactions like a noun. So instead of it being a- Interesting, that's a good point, yeah. okay. So instead of it being a verb that's like happening on an account, we're thinking about them like nouns. Okay. And so in our, in our minds, that's, that's one way to start to think about whether or not something should be a vertex or an edge. And it's, it's a rough rule of thumb um, so in, in this case, when we're thinking about an entity as a noun or a thing, it's much better for you to model those like actual vertices. So if you'd click over to 4.3. Oh, okay. I'm curious to see where this is going to go. 
Yeah, here we go. So oh, look at this. <laughs> so once we kind of get past the difference on an edge, come somewhat representing a little bit of a verb, somewhat of a verb versus these vertices representing actual nouns or entities or things in the database. The next evolution in your data model for how you want to model transactions usually ends up here. So you have accounts and you're like, all right, I'm just going to go with it and I'm going to add a second vertex label for this transaction. And that's kind of what you ended up here, right? Okay, so something I want to clarify though. So what I think I just heard was, you know, because generally speaking, right, when we're talking graph, nouns are generally your vertices and verbs are usually your edges, right? The things that Correct. you're going to have some action. But in a case like transaction, right, you've got transact, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the verb part, but then you could actually have a transaction as an object as well. And what I think I just heard you say was that, that there might, that this whole idea of the verb and noun thing is not an absolute. And mm -hmm. depending on your data model and your needs, and as you kind of explained that in this case, we're really looking at transactions less of the action of a transaction, but more of the thing of the transactions that we may need to kind of like map out that relationship a little bit differently, which is why we're treating it here like a noun and giving it a vertex label. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And okay. It's, a, it's a good true north to have for your team. And now it's like, whoa, this is a lot to think about when you're modeling graph, uh, graph data. But right. that's why we like to approach this with query driven design, right? We start with the okay. questions we're trying to get out of the graph database. Tell me the most recent 20 transactions involved okay. in Michael's account. And when we start with the, these questions and we, we apply query driven design, it, it gives you a, a, a guide to the tough conversations about if it's a vertex or if it's an edge. Interesting. Okay. So from, from here, once we, once, let's just like assume, okay, we're going to have okay. transactions as vertex labels. The hard part now is direction. So like mm. what, what direction do we want our edge labels to flow in? And what kind of like a, a side note, um, this exact example in the book took Matthias and I actually a few months to, Wow. but, but from the perspective of what's the best way to teach it, right? Cause you can, right, teach right. Any way, um, you can model this whole thing any way, but what's the best way to really teach this? Um, and so we spent a lot of time, we kind of put it on the burner and then worked on other parts and then came back and we're like, this is how we think we want to do The cool this. thing is you've, you simplified it and you've got it into a good mode now and it's in the book. So instead of other folks having to go and kind of noodle on that for months, you spell it out for them. That's yes. kind of the point, right? So exactly, exactly. That's yeah. what I meant by that. Not that graphic yeah. model. That hard. <laughs> just this I... one. Just imagine your project is going to take a long time. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just, just that. Even uh, people who have been working with this for decades, um, you want to be really thoughtful about what you choose here. So yeah, right. When it comes to direction, the first thing that I started with when I was writing the example of this book was to let. Um, the, the edges of our accounts to transactions flow kind of like how money flows. So I was thinking like, oh, you have a transaction or you have an account and money leaves that uh, account to go uh, into another account via a transaction. So kind of like what you see here, you have an account, you have money that leaves that account via a transaction and deposits it into another account. But like, okay. listen to that sentence I just said, an account has money withdrawn from it via a transaction to then be deposited into another account. That is, There's other, other verbs there. The verbs there are really, really difficult to reason about. And hmm. one of the ways that, one of the reasons why I love working with graph data is when you have a good graph data model, you can read the schema like your questions. And, right. and it makes sense intuitively to kind of read the natural language of your vertex labels and edge labels to form normal sentences. Okay. And if you have the directions of your edges and kind of the way money flows, you, you end up with some really, really awkward edge labels. Like there's just, there's just not a good edge label. And I mean, out to the whole world, if you all want to come up with some edge labels for this, I would love an example, but <laughs> I think my mind has already beat itself up over trying to figure out good edge labels for this. So, so then I go back to, so, so this is essentially the image we're looking at here uh, is just trying to say that if you model your edges, the way that money flows in this context, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so our, you know, our final recommendation on the next one uh, asks you to model, uh, asks you to model your edge labels according to your business question, right? So you have accounts and you have recent transactions. And so you can say that this transaction was a withdrawal from this account and a deposit to this other account. 
And this, mm. this helps you simplify a way you want to talk about your graph data and derive actual edge labels that enable you to ask questions that look a lot more like uh, your graph schema. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about the evolution of modeling transactions in your graph, the nuance of direction of edges and what to name your edges can be really, really, can create a really heated debate. Uh, and so I yeah. wanted to kind of show you the, the model of how I thought about this and also show you where we ended up for our final data model. So you all could see that journey on the way for a very common heated debate when it comes to modeling graph data. Yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna try to read the mind of some of our viewers right now and okay. partially myself. And I see something here that someone especially new to graph might be, huh? Which is, okay, I see this, I, I see that I have a vertex for transaction 184 and the deposit to edge label seems to make sense because I'm depositing into some account. Mm -hmm. But on the withdrawal from, in that case, it feels intuitively, I'm not thinking in a graph way, I'm just thinking from the picture. It yeah. feels intuitively that from a withdrawal from that the arrow would be going the other direction. Yeah. Could you help explain that a little bit? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. So um, let's think about if you had withdraw from, like what that would mean to your actual data model. So like if you had that edge flipped yeah, and you were saying the withdraw from was from the account to the transaction. Mm -hmm. In my mind, that's where things get a little squirrely. Right. Where now you're walking from an account going to a transaction saying this was a withdrawal from. Yes. This but it's backwards. Yes. It's that's right. To... And, and yeah. the second you said it out loud, right, there was there there is a like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, there was a there was a difference between what you said out loud and what I see here on the on the page. Right. Okay. And then when you said that out loud, it makes absolute sense. Yeah, because it's... Because you're like, well, no, you're not going to withdraw from the transaction. The transaction is the withdrawal. It is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's these conversations are really, really difficult. Um, and I we have them all the time. And there's going to be different groups of people who think about things differently around the world who might be reading this example being like, nah, I would have done this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Done this a different way. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, after, as I mentioned, after Matthias and I really worked through many iterations on this schema, uh, we, we kind of came down to this final version so that we have the data model, I think is which is on the next tab. I think you're at four, is that image four, five now? Um, yeah. we, I was on four, four, I'm on four, five now. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this kind of brings us uh, to the final schema. look at that. So that, yeah, this is gonna be our schema for a transaction vertex and the, and how we're gonna model these in with account vertex labels. So you have a transaction and it's a withdrawal from this account or you have a transaction that's a deposit to that account. Yeah. So it's once you just start at the data model, you're like, oh, I can I can think reasonably about how this schema works to answer my business questions. But it's the evolution where you start originally thinking about accounts transacting on other accounts, and you walk through how you're going to use that to answer your business questions that you start realizing that you're designing yourself into a hole, or you're designing yeah. yourself into queries that actually are going to be way more complicated. Uh, so my advice, my advice here uh, is two steps. My first piece of advice for when you're trying to learn graph data modeling first is to uh, start with your queries. So apply query driven design, uh, write out your business questions and the things that are entities or nouns of those business questions are going to naturally translate as vertex labels in your graph schema. The items that are verbs in those questions or, or the, the queries that you want to run, those are most likely going to be your edge labels. And so that's how we ended up with transactions and accounts being two different vertex labels. Got it. The okay. second piece of advice when it comes to graph data modeling is to um, allow direction to flow from how you want to query your graph. Because the first mistake oh. I made was to model direction according to how I thought about money. And that... Right that made it really difficult to answer the questions that we were going after in this chapter. So instead we wanted to model the edges according to the direction that made sense for our business questions, that transactions were gonna be deposits or withdrawals from certain accounts. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a, I don't know, like a new exercise maybe or a new muscle to kind of walk through when you're trying to model graph data. Uh, Cause yeah. we've, got, we've got a lot of things to consider, but um, so yeah, well, and I have a feeling too. We're gonna we're gonna kind of see this out, right, in the notebook, in the actual traversals. Um, 
I, I'm going to assume now, I'll admit, I did my homework. I went through them. But yeah. I was not thinking of the traversals in the context of this and what we just talked about. And now that we've just had that conversation, it's going to, and at least in my mind, I know I've got like a little flag set as we mm -hmm. go through those traversals to, to see then how they flow, right? And maybe, yeah. maybe what we could do is once we hit some of those, if we find a good example, maybe we can kind of, you know, do a thought experiment of what that may have looked like if we did it the other way. Yeah, um, we we could, and uh, I, I live thought wondered, experiments with Denise. Yeah. <laughs> I also wonder if I could find like if we went that direction. I don't know if I could find it like some iteration of the book from, like a year ago where we had the traversals oh. with the original data model, and yeah, they, oh my gosh, they were so much harder to understand. Um, I'd rather <laughs> we'll do the easy ones first. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, let's start there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, can you flip over actually to four nine on that image? <laughs> Yes. I can yeah. Awesome. So perfect. So what? So what you all see here now is we have, uh, we have the data model from chapter three. Yep. Yep. That's that's loan customer and credit card. We have those yep. guys already. And then and you see we've added on one one other piece of data model, right? It's right. The, and that's for just answering the first question. So the very first question that we're about to code to walk through the gremlin is what are the most recent twenty transactions involving Michael's account? So right. so David, how do you think? I mean, looking at the schema. And the question is, what's the most recent 20 transactions involving Michael's account? Can you kind yeah. of map out where we're going to be walking? I feel like we're going to be walking over the transaction vertices. I see the timestamp in here. Um, and the cool thing is you said most recent 20 transactions, not withdrawals or deposits. Yep. So that tells me we're going to want that, that most recent 20 from both withdrawals and deposits. What seems like is going to be very nice there is since that information is actually in our transaction vertex, I have a hunch I'm, I will see if this bores out, but I have a hunch that you guys probably are ordering with the clustering column and timestamp, and it's probably in descending order. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to make an assumption this is going to be quite easy to pull this out. Yeah. Um, and and that'll be it. I mean, like it, it's it's literally just walking into the transaction vertex and grabbing the la the last twenty or the most recent twenty, I should say. Yeah, uh, I agree, and I also am hearing an assumption that I think you're making. Um, oh, you said... I am making an assumption in here. No worries. Which one? Walking to a transaction. So where were you starting? Oh, walk? well, yeah. I guess I'm. I guess I'm not really walking to a transaction because I'm thinking about this. That for me to, uh, for what we did in, in chapter three, right? A lot of it was very customer centric, mm -hmm. and I would assume that if we want to find a set of transactions, we need to know what that customer is to be able to get their account. I, you know, and that kind of deal. So I'm making a base assumption that we're going to be going from customer to account. But then when I said walking to transactions, mm -hmm. given the directions of those edge labels, I'm not really sure that's correct. No, that's OK. Yeah. OK. I, no worries. Um, it doesn't matter the direction there. I actually was looking more for where you were starting your graph. Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm starting. In my mind, I was starting at customer. OK. And I think this is a really, really important piece um, okay. for people like you who have used graph data and graph uh, databases before, why are you starting at Michael? It's right, but why? You know, the first thing that came to mind when I thought of that, again, going off of chapter three, is what information am I going to have at that particular moment? Where am I starting? Now, if I'm already inside an application and I've already identified who my customer is, then do I really need to do that? No. And do I need to do that with graph? No, but I'm kind of, I, I was coming at this from like, I don't know yet who that customer is. And I, I want to, I want to start there to be able to get to that customer's particular types of transactions. If yes. that makes sense. It does make sense. And I, I would, I would go one layer deeper. Okay. And, um, how would you think about that actually from volume of like from a, from the perspective of the volume of data? Well, yeah, and one, Kamal actually yeah, just put it in YouTube. Kamal is yeah. totally right. <laughs> oh, is Kamal already has it? Yeah. Yes, um, yes, Kamal. That's, you know, funny enough, we, we have not talked, I want to be very clear, by the way, when we do these live series, we're not talking about this stuff ahead of time. <laughs> Denise no. is totally just throwing me out there. It's fun. Thank um, you so much, all the, by, by the way, David, for just being willing for doing Yeah, of course, too. of course. Yeah, but Kamal is exactly right. And I'm just going to read what Kamal said, right, if you're not watching the chat. 
Kamal says, because otherwise you'll have to scan all the transaction vertices and it might be expensive. And interestingly with that, I'm glad to see that Kamal and I were kind of on the same page. And this goes back to something you were explaining to us in previous episodes, where again, comparing to the relational world and graph world, instead of doing a select from where, right? I'm doing a where from select. Correct. And so here, my initial thinking is, well, if I start with the customer, I'm essentially doing my where that is immediately going to significantly reduce the amount of things that I need to look at to, to get to my transactions compared to if I just started, you know, like with transactions, all of them or something. I mean, you could have billions or, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so anyway, was that, was that it? Did That's I get it? That's exactly it. It's about specificity. <laughs> <laughs> and Kamal also got it. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, just to kind of restate that, it's about starting with as small, with the few of pieces of data as possible. Um, yeah. So everything that you all are both talking about, it's all about minimizing that starting set. So cool. we're either talking about starting from one customer and then kind of filtering to their accounts and then only their 20 transactions. Or yeah. if we did that in the reverse, it would be all transactions, Yeah. like the most recent 20, and then guessing if Michael is in one of those uh, most recent 20, because- That would be painful. That'd be so painful. And You'd if, have to do so much iteration and yeah, that, that would be terribly painful. Yeah, because you have to think about the perspective of the database. If you start yeah. from transactions, we don't know which of the 20 transactions are Michael's. So we'd yeah. have to maybe pull a few thousand and hopefully reduce from those thousand to 20 that hit Michael. I don't know. Yeah, and um, that's, that's even, logic wise, it's even more challenging and more difficult. Why? Why yeah. not just start right with the customer, boom? And then you immediately are constraining your view to only be the transactions that you want. Yeah. So how about we go do it in Gremlin? Let's okay. go do it. Let's do this. All right. Oops. Here we go. Chapter four. All right. I take it this is where you want me to be? Uh, yes. Yep. Um, that's the that's the perfect spot to be. And uh, just refresh this real quick. No worries. No worries. There we go. Cool, cool. Yeah, so we we took like a deep dive offline um, on the schema and how we developed it. And uh, we we really, really went deep on how we built the schema for answering questions about transactions. The other questions that we're asking in this chapter uh, ask for things like which vendors did a certain customer shop at and with what frequency, and then updating transactions that are uh, you know payments from their mortgage loan and thing, things like that. So if you scroll down just a little bit in the notebook, we'll get the full data model that matches this the studio okay. view on the right. Uh, By the way, I just want to point something out that is fun to me. Okay. That step two are the instructios. <laughs> I didn't notice that before <laughs> instead of instructions. Nice, nice. Uh, That's I will, awesome. Uh, I'll get that fixed. On the I'm not doing that to try to call you out. I'm just, I think it's funny. I no, like instructios. It's like yeah, Cheerios no, but for instructions. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> it's No, not a problem. I uh, will file a ticket on GitHub and I'll get that fixed. Yep. So what you're looking at here on the left-hand side is the exact same schema as what you see on the right-hand right side. Um, the only difference, the left-hand side is what we drew in Lucid Charts. Um, and for those of you who just are joining in now, in the YouTube comments, we have a link to be able to read uh, our Lucid Chart images that we that were the production images that we put in our book. So for those of you who have the book uh, hard copy, you'll know that like all the images in the book are in grayscale, and they're you know they're pretty hard to to read. So if you want to read the book and have the color versions of the images, I recommend going to Lucid Charts and having that up as well. Okay. But the schema is the exact same as the one you have on the right, where the one on the right is uh, just the interactive version that we have uh, with Studio, so you can you know, actually see column names and things like that, so. Okay. Yeah. Cool, so the big part of chapter four is learning how to walk deeper into data, so we're gonna kind of skip the schema part for this, for this moment. Okay. And uh, if you wanna go back up to the top, we can use the hot link to drop us down to the, uh, the oh. first query. Uh, here in step three? Yep. yep, step three, it'll drop Boom. down. Oh, that's so convenient. Okay, cool. I tried to make useful notebooks. <laughs> so far, so good, so far, so good. Great, um, so if you can, if you don't mind just blowing that up just a little bit, that would be, uh, I think yeah, might be yeah. a little easier for people to see. Uh, for those of you on YouTube um, who don't mind, if you could let us know if, uh, if you can see that. Um, there we go, yeah, hopefully that's big enough. Yeah, hopefully that is big enough, it should be, um, okay. Awesome. So you know, for the first for some, I am not seeing the YouTube updates. I don't know why, but oh, no you worries. are. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just listen to you when you say things. 
Okay, no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, so this first one, um, David just walked, uh, just kind of talked about on the schema how we were gonna do this. We were gonna start from the customer, yeah. walk to their accounts, and then go to all their transactions and get the most recent 20. And so that's what we're gonna do here. Oh, you already got it, David. Line I, would, I was about to say, I just wanted to point out, <laughs> I, today I was, I was committed to doing that before you pointed it out. <laughs> that's awesome, that's awesome. Um, so do you want to, do you want to walk through this one? All right, let's do it. So, uh, as we already kind of talked, right, that, and the first thing I want to do is since we're essentially going to do our where clause up front, and we know that we're looking for the top 20 transactions from a specific customer. So customer zero in this case. So I'm going to, I'm going to find my customer. Yep. Then I'm going to, you know, we, we talked about that data model with account, right? So I'm mm -hmm. going to traverse over. I'm going to walk my gremlin over my owns, um, edge to the, to the account. Yep. Um, now here is where, now both the edges are here. Notice that it says deposit to and withdraw from both, and it says two, right? That's actually both the edges are in there just the way that it, it depicts it here in the uh, in the schema view. Mm -hmm. um, but here, this is those this, this is those inward arrows for both with, withdrawal from and deposit to. So we're gonna walk all transactions, right? We're gonna walk all of the transactions mm -hmm. for that particular account. Um, now, something that's interesting here is that we are ordering, which is sorting. So I got a question for you, Denise. Yep. I made an assumption in what the underlying data model on the Cassandra end might look like, which okay. is my assumption was, since I saw that we had a timestamp here, mm -hmm. uh, oh, it's zoomed up. I don't know if it likes that so much when it's zoomed. Oh. Uh, oh, maybe not. Here, let me see if that does anything different. Oh yeah, that's something we need to point out to the team. Anyway, okay. so I made an assumption here that because this was a timestamp, mm -hmm. that naturally would probably be a clustering column or something. Yep. I'm not sure that's correct here, though. And I'm curious by that because um, if it was, and if it was already set to descending order, I wouldn't actually need to do an order here, would I? Even in my traversal, because the data coming back would automatically be ordered. So am I making too many assumptions? You are not making too many assumptions. You okay. are picking out exactly what we envisioned the difference between these chapter pairs to be. So David, oh. this is like a brilliant question. Oh. Uh, so what, what you all are experiencing when David was ex uh, asking that question, the answer to your question, David, is yes. But as you saw in the data model, we didn't implement a uh, timestamp as a clustering column, correct? Oh, okay. So here's, here's um, so yes. So what you just discovered would be that conversation <laughs> between your data engineering team and your, um, you know, and, and what you're gonna do before you take this into production, you're gonna talk to your, your admins and your operators and the data engineers are gonna say, hey, this, this question that we need to answer for our application requires ordering on okay. the transaction vertex. So it's gonna be much better if in the database, our schema has the timestamp implemented as a clustering column so that we I can see. have fewer uh, steps to write in our query. So that that tip you just found is is the conversation that happens between development teams and the production team to make sure that you have enough indexes or have the right not indexes in this case that you have the right uh, key uh, key right. schema set up between your partition and your clustering keys. Right. Okay. So so then and, and maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but in future chapters, once we then implement the clustering column for timestamp, does that mean that? as long as, again, the clustering column order is set to descending in this particular case, that this particular part could just essentially go away. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. This, that's perffect. And so that's why um, that's why we set up the chapter pairs exactly like we set them up. Oh. We want, so most right? So most people who are getting started with graph technology want to get a basic model put together and then put their data in it and work through their queries. And that's why we're using the dev uh, traversal source so that you can walk through your, your okay. graph and figure out all of your queries without worrying about some of these details. Okay. But the senior engineer like yourself, David, would realize that in order to answer this question, you need to have a better partitioning schema on your, uh, uh, on your vertex label. And that, that would be something you need to do before you move to fraud. Cool. Okay, that's really neat. I'm I'm glad that that worked out that way, <laughs> because when I saw it there, I'm like, oh man, am I missing something about this? So no, I'm okay. Great, awesome. All right. So then to kind of finish up the traversal, right? So 
at this point, I'm getting, I'm working all the transactions. I'm going to, because we don't have that clustering column, I'm going to go ahead and order descending on timestamp so I can get the most recent 20. And I'm going to limit 20. There's my, my recent 20. And I'm going to pull out then um, the transaction ID. And that's what you see down here. So I have the most exactly. recent 20 transactions. OK. Exactly. And uh, it sounds like uh, uh, you can imagine the, hand the handoff that happens between development and prod. And now first up on your list is that we need to make sure that that clustering set column is set in prod so that we optimize this traversal. This, this yeah. is exactly what it's like to build graph applications. You, you work through a query and then you figure out an optimization that you have to apply for your production schema. And you know, something else, I'm going to just go off on a limb here and let's see, I haven't, oh, I can't turn that on here. No, 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 no. I'm trying to remember what is the, uh, oh, I can't believe I forgot it, Denise. What is the name of the trace capability? Uh, what do you mean the trace capability? Like not profile? Thank you. That was oh, okay. it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm yeah, glad that was it. Other's minds. I don't know if I'm more scared or if you should be more scared. <laughs> <laughs> so so something it's a really I just want to point this out because this is something now I have not used this in quite a while. Um, and Studio has been updated a bunch since this time. I'm actually gonna pull mm -hmm. out the zoom a little bit because it's a little much yeah. for yeah. certain parts. Um, but a really neat capability here in Gremlin is this dot profile and the way it's visualized in studio. Mm -hmm. uh, so what this will do for you is it's going to show you like, like the parts that are taking the longest in your traversal. Okay. And it might be, you know, like something to kind of like take a look at. There's more detail and such you can get um, mm -hmm. and see, uh, you know, and, and kind of see what's going on underneath the hood. But this is definitely an area that I would come to in the past. Once I had traversal worked out and I wanted to see how, how's it look, how's it performing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the place I'd go, right? Yep. I would check out the profile and start looking at it. And this might be an area then where you can kind of look in here and then kick you off to, oh, wait a minute, right? I might be doing a lot of work here in this particular spot. Maybe I need to look at this if if it hadn't come to mind about doing a clustering column or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think if you, for those of you who are watching and maybe are more familiar with Cassandra, uh, what you can find uh, are some details there. Uh, I mean, if, as you're, Clicking on a certain step on the left, it actually shows you the full Cassandra query that we run on the right. Because yeah. underneath, this is a this is a native graph database that's in Apache Cassandra. Uh, so you can actually see here as we're walking through the tables every Cassandra query that's on the right and the amount of time it, it takes on the left. Yeah, David, awesome. Uh, and Kamal is super excited about the profiler. Uh, we actually have more profilers too that we will get into in future episodes. So. Ooh, all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop taking. No, that's Oops. awesome, man. Take take the conversation where we need to go. That's what these are for. No, I meant I'm going to stop. Here we go. I'm going to I'm going to stop taking the uh, the focus or start taking. What am I trying to say? The uh, the thunder from the future stuff. That's what I was trying to say. I was having a hard time coming up with the word thunder. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. I, I at the same time I think you uh, you made your own thunder over here with uh, the Easter egg that is uh, that 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 is profile. So awesome. <laughs> cool. All right, cool. So uh, it looks like uh, it looks like here in the notebook uh, there is a bonus notebook only query which happened every now and then. By the way, um, so what was yep bonus query notebook only? Uh, so on this one, we wanted to go back and use the project by uh, pattern from the oh nice yeah. Okay. So we don't have this in the book. Uh, this is okay. just notebook only bonus material uh, where for the exact same uh, question that we just said. Uh, yeah, this uh, is the same as the previous one. Yeah, okay. instead of just showing the transaction uh, de uh, transaction ID, we wanted to look at the time that that transaction occurred as well. Uh, so in I order, see. yep, if you remember how we did that in the last chapter, we used the project statement to create and shape JSON payloads where the arguments of project are the keys and then you need a by modulator for every key. Uh, at least that's not the only way, but that's the recommended way that I would I would say to to use project by. So for on line seven here on this one, we've walked from Michael to his accounts, and now we're on twenty transactions because of the limit on line six. And uh, for each of those individual twenty transactions, we want two pieces of data. We want the ID and the timestamp. So right. we we construct that JSON payload um, on seven through nine. And it provides you right here as a nice table, as you see in the, the center of the studio console. But if you press the the, uh, the brackets on the left, if you don't mind, David, sorry. Uh, oh, you, um, no, I'm sorry. What, on the left, you said press the brackets on the left. Oh, yeah. you mean you want the JSON view. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm with you now. 
JSON okay. view. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So now you can start to see. Sorry, I, I, I'll go, I'll, I'm curious about what you were lo looking at on the right side. Sorry. Um, <laughs> if you want to actually look at the JSON payload and its structure, you can flip between the table view or actually looking at the, the payload structure there. So Yeah. And what I was actually looking at over here is so something about project that I've at least done in code. So for the developers out there who are coding with this stuff, I've ended up using project a lot to be able to massage the data, the end mm -hmm. result data, into what I actually want to use for objects I'm going to store the data in in my code, mm -hmm. right? So I can get access to those. So I actually kind of was looking at that. And what I wanted to do is I, I feel like sometimes um, when I was first starting out with Gremlin and, and Graph, that it's like, well, where did these come from, yep. right? And if in, I, had, I was thinking about it, well, wait a minute, at this point, we've actually then walked to a set of transactions. Transaction is our vertex in this case. And these are just properties that are on that vertex. We're just pulling them out. We're just pulling them out from there. But I want to make that connection. That's what I was doing. I was like, kind of just, okay. I want to verify in my mind that that's what I thought it was. Yep. Um, but yes, project is something, like I said, from a code standpoint, I use that a lot in code. Once I've gotten to where I want to go to, once I've put my gremlin where I, where I want to go to, to then pull the actual data out to use in variables and such. Yeah. It's, I don't know, project by is one of my favorite ending steps at the end of a traversal for exactly the reasons you just said. So cool. So I think our goal today was to get to understanding ordering objects versus pipelines. And I think that's exactly where we're going next. Woo All right, let's see. Do, 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 do. So query two, um, the next, the, well, not query two, but like the second main question that we're trying to ask in our overall example is in December, you know, which shops or vendors did Michael shop at? And then tell me their frequency, right? So if we're thinking about our data model, which is kind of shown on the right-hand side here, we're going to start at a customer. And then we're going to walk over to their account. Wait, hold on. Oh, that makes sense. We're going right? to the credit card, right? Yep, credit, card. They use the credit card. Yep, yep. Thank you. Yeah, so we're going to go a different direction this time. We're going from the customer. We're going to go to the credit card. We're going to go to credit card transactions. Oh, right. OK. OK. And then we're right. going to end up at vendors. I see. I'll pay. Yep. Okay. So, kind of following in your mind, uh, if I always recommend when you're when you're starting new graph queries that you either have your schema pulled up as a picture or you're drawing it out because just that map of where you're going is super important. Yeah. We're trying to figure I, it out. I, honestly, I'm always amazed at people who can do this without their schema. <laughs> I always have these up. Period. Yeah. Even ones that I've created, I've, I've had ones that are like only two or three vertices, I have my schema up. Because <laughs> the there's something about visually seeing it, and then you can just walk in and go, oh, I'm going to do, OK, duh. Other one, trying to memorize it, yeah. Yeah, it's, and I think it takes, it takes practice, just, mm -hmm. like, just like anything else. Um, you know, I would say it really took me three or four years of working with graph data to finally get like a new schema and then immediately just be able to use it in my mind without having it written out. Um, it takes a while. Yeah. Uh, but and the bigger they get, of course, the more you have to hold in your mind. So I guess it depends. Yes, yes. It depends on just how good maybe you, how comfortable you are with like pulling up Google Maps and looking at it for a bit, and then walking yourself around a new city. Uh, yeah. I think that there's probably an interesting correlation there between how comfortable you are for navigating <laughs> yourself versus how comfortable you are at navigating graph schema. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fun tip: Whenever I go on trips with my friends and family, I'm the one who always learns the map and then navigates everyone all day. We're probably seeing a connection here. <laughs> That's funny. I'm the one who usually would rely on you as the friend to navigate everywhere because I didn't remember that we <laughs> talked about using a map in the first place. Nice. And I saw a door and I want to go to that door. Let's go to that door. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> so speaking of that, let's uh, let's navigate around this graph and answer the okay. question. Yeah. So okay. um, this question is going after trying to say in a certain time window, I want to know, you know which vendors an individual shopped at. Uh, which is a very, very common e-commerce style of question when when uh, companies are trying to kind of look at emerging emerging demands or trending, like trending places to shop. Right, uh, right. They're really curious as to frequencies and distributions of uh, shops and number of purchases at shops, maybe during certain time windows to predict, you know, what's an up, up and coming trend. Uh, so I've, I've, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, something I'm noticing here, and, you know, we've kind of expanded on the, schema a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Because originally, we were starting with what? Uh, customer loan, 
uh, account and credit card. Then we expanded into these transactions. And in the first, when we first started talking in the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, we were only talking about the account transactions. But now, since we made transaction a vertex, mm -hmm. it account for more than just deposits and withdrawals from an account. There are also other types of transactions, like these charge transactions and the pay piece. And I noticed that transaction itself actually just lent itself to being much more widely used. And now it becomes almost like a focal point of all the types of things that can be going on with an account um, and credit cards and everything. So I, I, I was like, oh, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I just, it was just something that kind of it just kind of like hit me and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's that it started, it, it just started to naturally expand even more yes. compared to what we first talked about. Yeah, and that's, I don't know, David, that's why I love graph data because you can, you can model different things in one database and then ask a, an entire myriad of questions just based on where you're yeah. walking. Um, there's a lot more flexibility that come with it to your point. So. Yeah. Um, and I had a great question over here on YouTube. Uh, gonna reshare the link to downloading chapters three through five. Um, it over is available. Over there, I see, yeah. Yeah, it is, uh, it is available for free, chapters three through five as a PDF. So just sent that link over in the Datastacks Dev YouTube channel. Uh, and there's also a way to get free access to the book and um, I'll link that at the end. So, but let's get through this uh, query because there's some really cool stuff coming up. So what we're doing, uh, just like in the last few queries, we're walking through neighborhoods of data. So on line one, you're starting at a certain customer, and our goal is to figure out the vendors that that customer shopped at with their credit cards. So we know that we're gonna go customer, to a credit card, to transactions, and then the vendors. So we're going through so three neighborhoods of data. Right, right. right. So we're gonna go customer on line one, and then on line two, we walk out to uses. So at the end of the traversal step on line two, you have credit cards. Right. And okay. with the way the edges were, we have transactions charge credit cards. So we're gonna walk in the charge edge. Okay. And at the end of line three, we're at transactions that were charges to credit cards. Yep. Okay. Now, we know that time is stored here on the transaction. And the question is asking for uh, transactions in December. So what we're gonna use here is we're gonna, we're gonna use a filter, the has step is a filter, and it's gonna look at the timestamp value on every single credit card charge. And it's gonna say, is this timestamp between those two, uh, those two values? Uh, right. And th what you're looking at there are the um, ISO 8601 standard for storing time. So I thought that for examples, it'd be much easier to work in that standard, though less efficient on the database side. But for the examples, we're gonna stick with the, the timestamp stored like this. Okay. And by asking for the start time and end time, we're gonna make sure that every transaction that passes this filter has a timestamp in December of 2020. So we're looking in the future here. And, uh, and then once you have uh, all of your transaction vertices that happened in December of 2020, you're gonna walk through one more edge and you're gonna go out to the vendors. And that edge was the pay edge. So we've walked out pay. And now on, at the end of line seven, we are at all of the vendors uh, that these that these uh, credit card transactions happened in December. You with me? Yep. Cool. Yep. cool. So we have a bunch of vendors. And what we really want to do is we just want to say, well, how many times do we see Nike? How many times do we see Amazon? How many times do we see Target? And it looks like you probably ran that recently and got those results. Yeah, and I'll just run it again for fun. Okay. There you go. Awesome. And uh, that's what the group count does. Uh, group count essentially takes uh, an entire group of vertices or objects in your pipeline, and it counts them up uh, into a certain property that you that you uh, give it with the by modulator. So we say by vendor name, and that's how we ended up with uh, the different values. What I find most interesting, though, David, is that um, before and after you ran those queries, the values went up. Yeah, one uh, I had not rerun this one since I had done some of the data generation pieces, and that actually gets into uh, one of the questions I had from earlier about the data generation, because we haven't really talked about that piece yet. Yep. Um, and uh, what I realized is when I was doing the data generation on every subsequent run, the numbers were going up, which then when I looked at it, I was like, okay, that makes sense. That's probably where those extra pieces come from. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So for those of you following along, um, if you're following along in the book or you're just using your queries straight out of your setting up with Docker, uh, you're gonna end up with different values here. And I believe it's uh, three, two, one, 
uh, three at Target, two at Nike, and one at Amazon. Uh, so those okay. are the values that we actually have pre-set up in the database uh, for you. But David, actually, could you show them the data generation script? Yeah. So by the way, if for those who are like looking at Studio and you're wondering, well, where did this tab come from? Like, what's he doing? Um, so you'll find if I go to start, I start these, you'll see for chapter four, there are two notebooks, right? We have the one that we've been working through this neighborhood dev, and then we have the chapter four data generation. So this one over here is the data generation piece. Now, if you're wondering, by the way, well, how do I even know to go there? I'll just scroll back at we're at 3B. Up here, this is what I was going through part of my homework. Hmm. Um, you'll, you'll be working through the stuff, creating your schema, things like that. And aha, right here, if you're reading through the instructions, it's going to tell you if you want option A, which is what I was after, then run this chapter four data generation. So that's how I knew to go to that notebook and that it was there and to go do something with it, right? Um, so mm -hmm. I'm just going to scroll back down. We're at 3B. That's three. So wait, did I go too fast? Nope. I must you're doing good. How did I go 3C before 3B? Oh, I, I, I missed oh. That, that last one. Oh, oh you, you, there's lag. That's right. There's lag in what you're seeing. Here it is. I forgot. OK, so that prompted me to go to, to the um, the chapter four data generation piece. Now, you after you go through creating some schema and such, there's some fun in here. This is actually a fun, fun graph, but I'm skipping over it just for a moment. Yeah. And here we have some convenience functions, but then you're going to notice this. This is what I'm looking for, right? So it's really cool is it looks like Denise and team have, have used um, Gremlin to create a set of functions mm -hmm. that are going to help kind of randomize and produce some, you know, generated data. And then finally here at this for loop, I'll stop moving around so you guys can actually look at that. Finally, at this for loop, we're going to loop through 100 times and we're going to, you know, start executing on these previously generated functions to start generating our data. So if you do that once, you're going to get all the data that Denise is talking about. But if you keep going through in subsequent runs, then this is what my question was earlier. You have it up here somewhere. Where does it say it? You have a data validation piece. Where is it? Don't mind my scrolls, folks. Let me uh, just, ah, here we go. Here we go. This, right? So what I have, what I was noticing was, yes, my vendor vertices, the count was fine, but my transaction vertices and charge edges and pay edges were a lot higher. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, on my initial run, they were like this. And here's what I found out. So in the Docker images, and, and Denise, correct me at any point if I'm wrong on this, and just tell me I'm wrong, because it's fun. But um, in the Docker image setup, you've already preloaded the data to make it that much easier to get going. Correct. So I technically did not need to do this. Correct. So when I went through and I ran it, I just added a bunch of data into the system is what I did. Mm -hmm. um, so, so just a, a key kind of case in point, if you're going to go through and you're going to take a look at the the notebooks and you're going to use the Docker image to do it, data's already there. You could just go. However, if you're like me and you want to step through the stuff and you want to see what's going on, you want to do it anyway, just be prepared that your data counts and stuff might start to change, right? So if yep. you notice for my for my transaction counts, I have 272 for charge, I have 181. I suddenly lost the ability to speak. If I rerun this, we'll wait for a second, boom. Then if I recount, now this one I know is the same. And I'm assuming just with the data generation piece, it's, there's nothing yeah, else. Yeah, there's only see. three vendors, only okay, so Nike, Amazon, and Target. Stayed. Ah, you see that went up a little bit, right? Yep, 100 more. 186, right? right? My pay is probably going to change. Yeah. So it's starting to add on some data and stuff. So anyway, so part of that process, um, it just, you know, just expect that. So I don't think it's not an issue. But if you if you do the initial run, you haven't touched anything, the number should jive with what Denise is saying. But if you're doing more runs, expect those to change. Yeah, actually, so let's go rerun that last query then and see if you have more transactions to Nike and Amazon in December because... Oh, uh, yeah, the one over here. Yeah, because all those timestamps are randomly generated, so I'm curious. Oh, it stayed, that... it stayed the same in that case. Yeah, so it looks like on that one, we didn't have any transactions that hit between Michael in that month, so that happens. Yeah, awesome. I mean, because it's, it's, it's not deterministic data, right? It's random. It is. It is random, completely yeah. random. Okay. So, okay. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, I think then there's so when you're looking at this value or this payload here, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about you, but I personally like my payloads to be ordered, right? So okay. like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I typically when I write queries like this, I want the values to be uh, like in descending order or something like that. I see. 
And so that's the next query that we have in the notebook. And it's, oh, it's kind of okay. ending on a really, really heavy gremlin topic here. Um, but for those of you still with us, we're, I'm happy to kind of walk through it um, you know, in, a, in the few minutes that we have. Uh, but the thing is, is that we wanted to rerun this query, but we want the payload to be ordered, right? We want, uh, we oh, want the actual, okay. yeah, we want that final JSON payload to be ordered according to the values. And so we added on two steps. We added on order local by values. So here's the super deep gremlin piece that we're kind of getting into here at the end. That order step and the use of local. Yeah. So what's happening with order local, you're saying to order the map itself. If you didn't use local, you would say to order my entire pipeline. However, hmm. on this line, on line 10, you only have one object in your pipeline. It's the map itself. So there's nothing to order that map with. You want to order what's inside the map. I don't need to do it that way. I was So this here is that same exact reversal without the order. Correct. And so when you are talking about that, you're talking about the result here that we want to order this. Yes, I want to order that according to like the most frequent. Uh, I want Nike or Target to be on top because they have the most. Right. Now, if I did not include local. Yep, you can try it. Just delete local. OK, so. So I understand when we say that by using local, we're now by using local, are we essentially saying I want to order by the result of my traversal up until this point? No. Okay. Um, what we are saying, if you want to go over to the Lucid Chart tab, um, we'll do uh, four eleven as a picture. Ha! Huh. Did you have this set up? <laughs> did, I did. did you just totally straight person me right to this? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had no idea that you were doing that. That's hilarious. OK. So um, <laughs> I'm sorry that the answer to your question was no, David. But That's great. Uh, um, uh, here's the difference in local, like order local versus just regular order. Order without using local, so just order like you most recently ran, is okay. doing what's on the left. It's yes. taking everything in the pipeline and ordering it. So if you had like a bunch of vertices, it would order the actual oh. vertex objects. The oh, interesting. Though, so that's OK. OK. Yep. So it's going to order all the vertex objects. But at this point in our traversal, we have a JSON payload. We have a group count. Yeah, right, right. And, and what we need to do is we need to order the JSON according to the values in the group count. So that's why we need to do what's on the right hand side of this image. We need to use local scope and actually order just the JSON payload so we're ordering everything in that one object instead of ordering all the objects. So when I said, I OK, so from a pedantic standpoint, when I said we're ordering on the res by using a local that we are ordering on the result of this traversal, that is technically not correct. Because correct. And it's because we're ordering when you when you put local in there. So let's put local back in there. When you have local in your traversal, it's saying for every single object that passes through, again, we're talking about functional programming. We're talking yep, in streams. Yep. Every object that, passed through, that passes through this point in the stream, I want you to order it, order the actual object according to its values. Otherwise, uh, you would have held until every object got there, and then you ordered the objects themselves. Oh, 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 oh. OK, so are we saying then that I want to make sure I have this right because the group by the group count is kind of interesting here because I was what I was doing is I was looking at pretend this didn't exist. I was looking at it like, well, I've performed my group count mm -hmm. and I've res I've returned this group of data and then now I'm going to order it. Yes. Did I just hear that actually we're going to be traversing through this and because we said local, essentially it's going to be going, okay, you have this value, you go here. It's going to go through the next one. Oh, you've got this value, you go here or something like that. Is it doing it more in, in a, um, like, it's not like an inline kind of thing. I think I'm, I feel like I'm wrong. No, and I, I can't see like, your face. No worries. I feel like inline is, uh, is, is an interesting word to use there. Um, and I think there's there's plenty more examples that we get to throughout this book uh, for ordering with local versus global. Yeah. So um, I would I my first recommendation if this is the first time you're really digging into scope with gremlin traversals, I would ignore mm -hmm. group count here. Just ignore that for just this moment. Okay. 
Okay. And um, we walked through and we ended up at also a bunch of vendors, right? Yes, right. So the difference between local scope and global scope would be whether or not you want to order all of the vendor vertices like by their name, like alphabetically. Okay. Or if you wanted to say uh, you had one map at the end and you wanted to order just that one map within its values. Uh, and so okay. that's the difference between local and global scope. And for this example, I'm talking about two different traversals to make that to make that distinction. I see. Uh, so it's, I guess, to, to keep with our example, the difference is whether or not you want to order one map or you want to uh, you want to sort one map according to the values in the map or okay. you want to have four maps and like order the maps according to like some other thing about the maps. But you're not actually ordering the values within the map itself. So question for you, then I have a feeling that generally speaking, when you are ordering like this uh, at the you know, at the end of a traversal, you're, you're probably intending to order locally. Do yes. you find that most of the time that your orders are in fact local? Um, I, I, I do, but that's also because I usually am using order local for sorting a JSON payload at the end. Like I've okay. already constructed um, a JSON payload and I need to sort it according to its values and that, then I you're going to order local. Okay. Um, but if you wanted to, uh, if you didn't want to do this group count um, as an example, and you wanted to say order all of your vendor vertices by their name, that would be global ordering because you want to take every vendor. Ah, uh, right, 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 right. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a pretty deep concept to kind of end on here. It's, it's a super heavy yeah. one. Um, but for those of you who heard a few tidbits of this description and you're like, oh, OK, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, keep going with it and keep playing with uh, keep playing with it. Uh, we we talked about going uh, going about this live stream very much in the context of hey, just get out your code and your data and and make some mistakes and figure it out. Uh, yeah. cause that's the best way to figure out when you're learning a new language. Uh, so if you've got questions about oh well what would happen if you did this or what if you put local here, fire up the notebooks and break something and you know tweet us. Dave and I are happy to help you work through these examples or point you into different directions of what you should do uh, with your Gremlin traversal if you find yourself stuck. Uh, but yeah, this is the fun part about learning a new language. It's just playing with it until it breaks. Absolutely. And, you know, back over to this Lucy chart, I wish years ago, somebody had given me this one image. <laughs> this one image right here is really helpful in yeah, understanding no what is going on between global and local scope. So again, if this is something that you're new to and you're checking it out, go check this Lucy chart out. Use this, you know, just kind of refer to it because it makes it makes all sorts of difference when trying to understand how this is working compared to how it's not. Um, awesome. And you know, one last thing I will say about, uh, you know, if you, if you, any of you have questions out there um, and you don't wanna, you're, you're afraid that you're gonna look stupid by asking a question, just give it to me, I'll ask it because that's part of my job here is to look stupid when I can, um, you know, but, uh, but not really, but anyway, no, come, come ask me. I'll be, I'll, I'll be more than happy uh, to answer them live or to get, try to put Denise on the spot so I can get yeah. her back. No, uh, for, no uh... <laughs> I, mean, I, think we, I think we have a really good question to put me on the spot. And um, uh, we had a great question asking, is this like memoization? And that's actually a really good question. I hadn't really tried to synthesize those two concepts before. And I, I'm assuming that when we're talking about memoization, we're, we're just talking about like um, optimizing results with a cache? I mean, I, I, I believe that's what the, the reference is here. David, do you have any other advice on what that what the perspective might be for that question? No, I'm, honestly, that's one I think we could, maybe we could start next week with that, or we could follow up um, uh, with Nkata on that one. Because um, I, I don't know if it completely applies. And I honestly, I need to dig a little deeper on that one to see. Okay. Yeah, I I think just just from a, a quick uh, a quick response that's dangerously close to maybe being inaccurate. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, since you know since the question was asked, I don't believe that this is, this is close to memoization just because uh, that is referring to optimization through caching results. And what we're talking about is what do you order? Do you order everything that we've processed, or do we just order one thing? Um, so I, I can kind of see how it's closely related, but uh, I'm yeah. going to take this one offline, and um, you know, I'll, we'll tweet up a response uh, sometime. I think we need. I think we just created a new game, which is stump. Can we stump Denise? I'm. Uh, you can. It's easy. 
<laughs> uh, but uh, she I, says this. She says this. However, uh, anyway. <laughs> I, I'm happy to keep uh, happy to keep the questions going. Um, and if for some reason I don't know the answer, like in this one, I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, I'll post a response on Twitter. So follow yeah, me on Twitter, awesome. Denise K. Gosnell. Uh, Dave and I will figure it out and get you a question uh, answer. That was an awesome one. Thank you so much for the excellent question. Yeah, great. Well, we're obviously we're we're five minutes past time. Uh, so we do promise that we try to keep these within the hour. Uh, and Denise, do you have anything else that you want to wrap up with? Uh, yeah. So um, for uh, for next week, uh, we are going to dive into making fault tolerant JSON payloads in Gremlin. Uh, so we're going to be talking mm. about uh, using either try catch behavior or if then behavior, uh, so that you kind of so that you kind of construct JSON payloads uh, that are you know going to have a little bit of consistency and guarantee. Uh, between your application and then the downstream, uh, you know, downstream API that's reading that data. So you also, so that you make sure you always have data in that payload. So we're going to cool. be, now, that, yeah. Is that going to be here in chapter four, or are we going on to a different chapter? It is. It's a, uh, it's a part of chapter four, and oh, it's cool. a okay. section of chapter four. But the okay. early reviewers and readers have said that it was some of the most valuable material for learning Gremlin. So um, oh wow, we're gonna, okay. Yeah, we're going to stay in chapter four for this advanced section here. Uh, and really, really dive into some nuances of how to use coalesce uh, and how to coalesce kinda, is fun. Yeah, yeah. How to use coalesce and how to construct robust JSON payloads. So awesome. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Denise, as usual, and thank you everybody for coming on and watching today. And thank you again for your questions. Like we love those. That's that's part of what this show is about. And uh, we will see you again next week for another graph and code with Denise and David. All right, everyone. Take care. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Distributed Data Show. Please subscribe with your favorite podcast app